Mother's Day. Call Mother's Day. The world thinks we're mad. And the madder you get in Christ, the, the madder they think you are. But who cares? It works for us. Does it work for you? Yes. That's where, how we've got to look at it. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. In um, Galatians 3.26, a very interesting passage. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Then when it says sons, it means daughters as well, because that's, that's who we are as a body, okay? For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have, been, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And heirs according to the promise. Notice also too, just to make a point there, because it's Mother's Day today. Congratulations, Mother. Mothers. You've caused the New Zealand to grow <laughs> and the church. But anyway, it says here, neither female, male nor female, which is very interesting because in a, in a lot of um, denominations we, you know, that we were involved with in the past and so forth, the, the female was not allowed to, to be up front, as it were. They're not allowed to be in leadership. They could do the children's work, but not in leadership. Well, here it's quite neither male nor female. Is that right? That's quite clear. We're all equal in Christ. We're not, one's not more superior than the other. We're all equal in, in Christ. But the part I want, verse 29, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So as heirs, we are according to what God has promised us what Jesus has purchased for us. Is that right? Now, if you've ever been to um, a, a reading of the will, it's always after the person has died that everything is left to the different ones. Is that right? And, and if you are a son or a daughter, you are automatically, except in very rare occasions, but anyway, as far as it should be, automatically that you inherit what was left by the person that died. Is that right? Now, in Christ, when, he, when Jesus died on the cross, he then gave us all that we ever will need to make things happen. Is that right? We're heirs. It means it's automatic. He dies, we inherit. He dies, we inherit. That's why... It's called the New Testament, the new will and testament of Jesus Christ. It supersedes the old. Ooh, isn't that exciting? And it needs to because it's really exciting what's in the new. It tells us what the promises are. And if you take some time, you'll find out all the promises. We are promised health. We're promised prosperity. Not just to make our life better, but to, to, it's, it's, a, it's a better life to show others, hey, you serve the living God and this is what he does for you and also gives us more to give away. Is that right? God has been so incredible. You know, we're, we're talking about um, the 24 years and I can remember in those first few years it was pretty tough going. We actually used to have to pray the next meal in. Go to the fridge and there'll be nothing in it. Say, Lord, we thank you for the next meal. Somebody will knock on the door and bring us $10 or some eggs or something. This happened frequently. I think the thing that's, that's really excited me over the years is that our wage has been less than what our rent has. And yet we've paid it. We've never been behind. And I've tried, I have tried on several occasions to work it out on paper and I gave up. God is my provider. And if you choose to, to walk by faith and live in him, then all things will be supplied. All things. There is no shortage with God. 
The Bible says, hands not short that he cannot supply. So that's how we got to see it. Now we need to really grab hold of this as we move into that end times because things are going to get tougher. But not in us, because we can trust in him. And I think one of the greatest revelations that's come out in the last few months is that if you've got a sickness in your body, you can say things like, Oh, Jesus, have you got cancer? Did you ever have cancer? Did you ever have flu? And the answer is no, because he took it to the cross. So if we are sons and daughters and heirs in him, then why should we have it? Man, that really touched me. when they, it, it sort of really hit my heart when, when they said, Jesus, you never had cancer, so why should I? Jesus, you were never poor. So, oh, yes, he was very He wasn't poor. He had whatever he needed. He had a designer garment. It was so good that they cast lots for it. Whenever he needed to pay taxes, he just said, go. Find a coin in the fish's mouth. There was no lack. He fed 5,000. He said, fed 3,000. He fed the disciples. There was no lack. He even had a treasurer. Ooh. So being poor is being humble. You know what I was going to say then, didn't you? <laughs> so if you know, well then that's it. So Father, we just thank you. Let's all stand once again. It's good to get their blood flowing in your legs so that when Sue preaches, you won't fall asleep. Thank you, Jesus. I don't mean that in the wrong way. <clears throat> that was said in love. <laughs> wonder why I dig so many holes. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Let's be serious now. It's a serious time. Father, we just thank you that the plan that you sent Jesus to accomplish and what he accomplished, we honor him this morning as we partake of this emblem that represents his broken body, bruised and battered. and By the very people he came to save and set free. Lord, we just appreciate you so much and we give thanks. In Jesus' name. Let's take the bread. And that awesome price you paid of your blood being poured out upon the mercy seat. Poured out upon all those, the Ten Commandments and all the other things that we know are impossible to keep. But because of you, because of Jesus, we can walk in that freedom knowing what he's purchased for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see your smiling faces. <laughs> now I'm just going to read a bit out of Joseph Prince's book here, um, Affirmations, and it's just regard to our tithes. And um, yeah, I just I'd, li I'd just like to say this morning it's um, it's been really just a buzz, really, you know, just exciting to to you know do that we did the ribbon thing and to know that the church is already there so i just i'd like to just give thanks and uh thanks to all the mothers you know for my mother was probably expecting me to give her a call so i'll be doing that today and i have to put on these things so i can read okay god gives you power to get wealth just remember that it's not about our strength or our doing, it's about God. And I just, um, the idea that poverty is holy and wealth is a curse never came from God. It came from the devil 
who wants you poor. He robs this and steals from you. In John 10.10, 10, and even wants you to have a poverty mentality to keep you poor. God, however, wants you to prosper. You know, like that. God wants us to prosper. And he does by, it does it by giving you the power to get wealth. Having the power means that it is, it, if you are a businessman or a businesswoman, you will find yourself full of innovation, ideas, that will bring in huge profits for your company. Even as a, a salary worker, you will find yourself promoted quickly because you, your organisation values your contributions highly. I like that, that's good. God wants you to prosper. You, like how I prospered Abraham in all things, Genesis 24.1, so that he can fulfil a covenant he made with Abraham. God gave Abraham the power to get wealth. I'll just read the bottom here because I thought this is quite good. My friend, God wants you to be prosperous, you not just inwardly, but outwardly. And sometimes we can we can see that, you know, you know, you can be prosperous inwardly, but outwardly is all good too, because people sometimes in the world they'll say, Hey, those guys have something. What is it? And uh we just and I just I just re, I've been reading a bit in, in about David, you know. And one thing David he always had a had a joyous heart. I mean, he worshipped the Lord fervently, came before his presence, and just got into that got into that right frame and got into that love and joy and peace with God. And God just flooded him with his love, you know. He just flooded him, and that was quite evident when everything you know came to him. And uh, we just go here. I'll start again. Yet, my friend, God wants you to be prosperous, not just inwardly but outwardly. Two, three, John one two. So today, even if you don't have a cent in your pocket, remember the Lord your God. It is He who gives you the power to get wealth, so that He may establish his covenant with Abraham. And I'll just reflect on something. When Jesus sat in front of the treasury, he watched all those ones that gave, you know, the ones that are wealthy and the ones that weren't wealthy. And then the widow came with the two mites, you know, and I, the two mites were just like a penny, a copper coin. And uh, she gave everything she had and I just think Jesus sat there in front of that treasury. He watched a lot of people, and he saw her heart, and she gave it all. She gave everything. And I think it's quite impacting. So I think it's affirmation time. <laughs> Take those glasses off because I can't see them. <laughs> Okay, here we go. As we receive today's offering, we are believing you for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefit sales and commissions, favourable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you. Am I? Did I turn it off or on? Am I on? No? Did I turn it on? Oh, I am. 
Okay. Well, it's an exciting day. Yes. Oh, two of us think so. That's <laughs> good. Uh, first of all, I would, um, on behalf of Rod and myself, like to thank those of you that have given so diligently into this church, some for many years and some recently. It is just an amazing, amazing thing to know that God has placed around us people who have supported and believed in, um, in the vision that we've had for this church. And at times it seemed really difficult and it's, um, it seemed as though it was never going to happen. But it's like Andy said, you just got to keep believing because it will happen. May not have happened yet, but it will happen. And today, I believe that we had a real breakthrough. I felt that um, what, what Charlotte and, and Dan and Andy brought over the church was just powerful. Was, and they didn't know. Charlotte didn't know what was going on. And so, but God did. Amen. So we'd like to really appreciate you, all the givers. It's amazing. It's wonderful just to have people so faithful and diligent. So thank you. Now... I need you please to turn your ears on. You must hear what I am saying. In your newsletter, it says that next Sunday that our meeting will be held in the dance hall, which is across there. That is not going to happen. Okay? We will not be at the dance hall. We will be at the pavilion. Tightly squeezed and loving on each other. <laughs> Mind you, the dance hall would have been like that. It said it would have looked bigger because it's got mirrors, but you all would have been looking at yourself. <laughs> so that wouldn't have worked. We have found out that what is going on here is going to have stuff out there with bands and parades and stuff. So you wouldn't concentrate and you wouldn't get parking. <coughs> Okay, there'll be no parking around the place. I would suggest that even at our place that you um, sort of come fairly quickly. Rod's going to try and organise cars so that there is room for everybody to park. Now, we do have permission to park at the physiotherapist and there is a car park at the back of the building as well, at, at the back of the physiotherapist, not just the front car park. You can go down the side of the house and round the back. There is small parking out there. Now, be aware that when people, when there's a big thing on here, people park outside our place to come here. So there's going to be a bit of competition for parking next Sunday. So just be aware of that. And, um, but don't stay away because of it. Because it's going to be fun. We're going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> just be very sensitive as to how you park if you manage to get on our front lawn that there's plenty of room for everyone you know line up like like little boys do where they line all their little cars up <laughs> no way they could get them out but they all line up we'll get help you get them out so pardon I'm not going to say that at all You were away. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I, I saw you. <laughs> well, welcome home. <laughs> now, anybody that you know that is not here today that is normally in church, please let them know where the service is next week. I don't really expect them to pray and get it in the spirit. They can ask one of you, all right? <laughs> I mean, if you think they're that spiritual, they can, but let's just make sure everybody knows where we will be, okay? Right, I think that's all. You guys are going to have to get the DVD to see what we did. They're not listening, that's all right. Okay. So, pre-meeting is on on Wednesday night. Like I say, different things happen. And it's all good. All right. Are you ready for the word? Yes. Okay, take your Bible in your hand. And I want you to say this. 
This is my Bible. It is my love letter from God. It shows me I am standing under an open heaven. I am drenched with endless showers of grace. It's nothing to do with me. It's about what he did. And he has made me to be greatly blessed, highly favored, and deeply loved. And I receive the word now into my heart to change me. In Jesus' name, thank you. <laughs> One of the, the things that we many times fail in is what we're saying over our own lives. And it's really important that we are speaking it. You know, the, the words of the songs that we sang today, they all are telling on what Jesus has done for us as individuals. Very, very important that you declare over your life what Jesus has done. And that's why I've the last few times been doing that, just so that we get our minds set on what the Word of God has done for us. Amen? This morning, I'm going to carry on a little bit from what Rod started last week. He asked me to continue, but because I'm me and he's him, it'll be different. <laughs> because we both hear and see from a different angle, and, but we're going to use the same verses. And really want to see that we're walking in the victory that Jesus Christ has paid such an awesome price for. So let's turn, first of all, to Hebrews 13 and 12. And we started off in verse 14. Strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue that consecration and holiness without which no one will ever see the Lord. What's it talking about? It's asking us, it's giving us a, um, a, a perspective of what we should be looking for in our lives. But it's not saying that we've got to look holy on the outside. No makeup, hair pulled back and sucking on, on lemons. That's not what he's talking about. It's not being um, a people that can't enjoy the world that he's put us in. It is, it's talking about looking to see what he's poured out on our lives. You know, our holiness comes from being in him. You can't do anything to make yourself holy. We're just saying the words not about what I can do, but about what he has done in me. And when we, when we finally allow ourselves to understand that everything in our lives needs to come from what he's done instead of what we can do, we're all going to be so much better off. We're all going to be um, in that place of victory. But because of our, um, our Greek up upbringing and schooling and things like that, we are on a plane of what we do is what makes the difference. Instead of living from a Hebrew understanding, what he's done is what we need to be holding on to. You can't be holy or strong in him unless your believing is in him. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not about us. It's about him. Everything in this gospel is about him. But the church world has turned the gospel to be about us. But you see, this word, this whole Bible is telling on Jesus. But we've turned it to be a book of telling on our mistakes. 
Does that make sense? So uh, what we're trying, what we're believing for, what we're living for even in our own lives is changing it so that we start to live from what he's done instead of from what we can do. Because I don't know about you, but I've mucked up a few times, quite a few times. I made mistakes. And praise God if you didn't. Some of you are smiling. <laughs> Some of you are not admit admitting to anything. <laughs> But we need to we need to turn our thinking to it being about him instead of being about what we can do or what we can um, get what we can change to make this word work. No, when we're thinking from the fact that he's done it, we talked about um, you know we say and we just made that confession about living under an open heaven. That's who we are. That's our right. Why do I say that? Well, it talks about an open heaven in the Old Testament or the heavens being opened. Is that right? In Malachi, it says that if you tithe, God opens the windows of heaven. But so often we sit there trying to get the windows open. Well, in the Old Testament, you tithed. That did it. That was, the, that was the answer to it. If you didn't, it didn't. In the New Testament, it says, when Jesus went into the waters of baptism, the heavens were opened. Didn't say they were ever shut again. Our mentality is that there's this hard heaven. No, the only hardness in the heavens is in between our ears. You see, God has already released the power of the Holy Spirit on this earth for us to live with, and live with and live in. But because we have a concept in every area of um, Christendom is about what we do to make it work, that's the wrong way to look. We must change our thinking to become about what he's done. You know, even... Even now, if we live with the simple formula, windows open because I tithe, just get on with it. What do I expect? I live from a different expectation. If I'm thinking that God's holding out on me, then I'm never going to live in the fullness of what he's done in my life. Is that right? Okay. Now, verse 15 Exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another to see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace, his unmerited favour and spiritual blessing in order that no root of bitterness, rancour, uh, I'm sorry, in order that no root of resentment, rancor, bitterness or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment and the many become contaminated and defiled from it. The NASB says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. How do we come short? You know, Rod talked from one angle on this last week, and brilliant. If, if you didn't hear it, you need to hear it. But I want to come from a slightly different angle, because... Because we are so often negative thinking, we go for the negative angle. And I want to come from what Jesus has already done for us. He said that, um, hold on, it's, a, it's halfway on a, two pages. It's <laughs> See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. What's it talking about? Do you know that every area of your life has the grace of God flowing into it? You have the grace of God for your health and your healing. You have the grace of God for your finances. You have the grace of God for your family relationships. You have the grace of God flowing for your job. You think up other areas of your life where the grace of God is poured out and coming upon you. Is that true? 
So this says, see to it that no man comes short of the grace of God. How do we come short of the grace of God? Think of it, I heard it described like this, that there's all these pipes coming from heaven, you know, each one, one for wealth, one for finance, um, for health, one for family, one for job, one for all of these areas of need in our lives. They're not hard pipes, they're not pipes that, um, that, are, that are solid, they're rubber pipes that are coming down. Now, you might be flowing well in the grace of health and healing in your life. Nothing wrong in that area. You're, you're fine. You've got it all together. You know exactly what the word says. But this other pipe of grace for uh, wealth has just got you puzzled. You just can't seem to get the breakthrough. What happens? How do we stop that? Have you ever watched somebody who is hosing and somebody comes along and crinks the hose. And then when they turn it up to have a look to see why, you let it go. <laughs> oh, you naughty people! <laughs> you all started to laugh on that one. You can see that. <laughs> but that's what we do. How do we do that? How do we crink and stop the flow of the grace of God? Unbelief. Who said, somebody said something over here. Works. Trying to do it ourselves. You can't earn the grace of God. You see, we fall from the grace of God by doing it by our human strength. We have been so programmed over the years. Well, if you do this, then God will do that. No, the word of God says he's already done it, not by what I do, but what he's already done. When Jesus bought and paid everything on that cross, he did not ask our opinion and he didn't tell us to do anything except to believe. But you see, unbelief causes us to try and make something happened to find the world's way to make God work. Don't happen. Because God is not obligated to do anything other than release his grace, which he's already given us. He's already given us. He has given us the power to get wealth. Old Testament, we have a greater covenant. So if we had the power in the old, what have we got now? Everything. He didn't say, oh, well, that was Old Testament, so you get nothing. He says, no, let's put it through the cross. Now you have everything. Nothing missing, nothing broken. It's all poured out for you and for me. What's the need in your life? Stop trying to fix it. Come to the grace and find out what he's already done. That'll change what you're doing. It goes on from there and it says, so that, okay, let's read it all the way through. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God so that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. How does a root of bitterness come and cause us to go from this part of where grace is flowing and then we just pull back and pull back and pull back? Why? When we're trying to do something for ourselves, when we're saying to God, well, I've done this and you haven't kept your promise, guess what? we start to allow a root of bitterness to come up in our hearts. When we go to somebody and we say to them, this can be on a personal level, it can be on God level, when we go to somebody and say, but I did this for you and I did that for you and you aren't doing what I want you to do, guess what? We've allowed that root of bitterness to start to grow in our hearts. 
What will that do? That'll crink your, your pipe, no problem. It'll stop the flow of grace in every area of your life. You see, he's already poured it out. Think about it. Like I said before, this is just a simple way of, of thinking about what God has done for us. He said that he has poured out his finances. He said he's given us health. He said he will help us or he will give us the grace for our, um, for our families. All of those things he's told us. Is that true? He says that the grace is poured out for our job. The simple thinking that we need to start to have in God is that tithe, Windows open. No tithe, no windows open. Full stop. Not about what I feel, except in the New Testament, the windows are open. So I don't have to be bothered about that. I can just yield and know that God's pouring it out upon me. But bitterness that gets into our hearts and our minds comes, we fall from the grace of God because we try to do it our own way. That's a religious spirit. We live from this mentality, well, I did this, so you should do that. Well, God, you did that over there for that one, so why haven't you done it for me? Hey, that's where the root of bitterness comes in. You've fallen from grace. Grace is yielding to the power and anointing of what he's done, believing he's good always. When we say to God, you haven't done this for me, I don't believe God is good. Well, it hasn't happened yet. Hey, 24 years down the track, we've just opened our, business, our building. Even Abraham only waited 25 years for a baby. <laughs> no, we'll just borrow the ones that are there. <laughs> You, you can get into a mode of being cranky and allowing that spirit of bitterness to start to rise in our hearts and our, in our lives. What happens? It then shoots out roots to every other area. It makes us a very negative person. It makes us a very critical person. We will never see any good in anything else. It's what bitterness does. Why? Because I didn't get what I wanted. My way, whether it be from people or whether it be from God. How do we fall from grace? By trying to do it our way. Human reasoning. By trying to fix it because God's too slow. Oops. Without the grace of God, you cannot have holiness or peace with God or with man. You'll always feel like you're let down. You'll always feel like nobody's doing it, including God, for you. You see, we've become so used to doing things for ourselves. I did it my way. That's been a big problem in the church in the West, is doing it our own way, of finding our own solutions to what God hasn't done. Why? Because we haven't believed and waited for him to do it his way. And his way will never fail. His way is a seed, is a, is, a, um, is a product that is perfect, that will not fade out, that will not die out on us. It's not like a plant. Every year I buy a pot plant of these. Every year I plant them. Every year I have to go and buy another one. Cause I <laughs> you see, I've done it my way. <laughs> I'm not good with those things, but God grew it right because he always makes sure that I got new ones for you. <laughs> that was beside the point. He 
peace with all men. Peace with God comes from the grace of God. Do you know that you can't breathe without the, without the grace of God? That the sun doesn't shine without the grace of God? That this world doesn't keep turning on its axis without the grace of God? It's so important that we stop being big-headed thinking we know a better way to do it. If this world has got to turn by the grace of God, then why do we think we can fix our problems? That we can do it our way? doesn't accomplish. But when we allow him, that grace to flow through us, then he will show us the right way to go for us. And when God shows us the way to do it, then what we do as a good Christian is write a book and tell everybody else how to do it. They don't work. Because that grace is for that group. It's really important that we don't suddenly think, oh, that's the way you do it. Now I've got a principle. Now let's show everybody else how to do it. How many... No, don't go there. How many... How many Principle books have we read over the years. Do this and God will do that. No, let's allow ourselves to be in that place that the grace of God is what is working. It'll be a lot quicker. And then we won't get all bitter and twisted and upset. If you have a look, or if you saw how much we get coming across our desks, of meetings to help people overcome their bitterness and their anger and their this and their that and all the, all the programs that are out there because even in a Christian world, we've got a whole world of Christians that are bitter against God. Yet this is so clear. It says, don't allow yourselves to fall from grace because when you fall from grace then you come into bitterness. And in the next verse, it said, that's where promiscuity um, and um, sexual sin comes from because we've fallen from the grace of God. In 2 Peter 1.3, it tells us that his divine power has granted us everything for life and for godliness. Everything. Everything. Think of it in, in just an everyday area, an everyday um, position in life, your job. He's given you everything for life and for godliness. He's given you grace that you need to be the best in your job. He's given you grace this is going to shake some, rattle some cages, even for your health or your weight or your exercise or your sleep. But so often we don't ask him because we've got so many others that tell us how to do it. Have I succeeded in them all? No, but I know where the grace comes from for that breakthrough my life you see when we stop doing things under our own steam and start to ask him first then he'll show us how our steam can be the better sort of, the, the less um, to where you get burnt out in that area whatever area it might be when you're working, when we fall from grace and we are trying so hard to do everything, that's when we get upset and bitter and cranky at God when it doesn't go right. Is this just me? But we haven't been, uh, the church overall hasn't talked to us about trusting God. We've got I've got a mountain of books that tell me how to do it to make God work for me. Some of you have, may have noticed our library has gone right down the hill. Why? Because I got rid of most of that. I haven't gone through the rest of them yet. Most of what we've got left is the Left Behind series. <laughs> 
because it doesn't tell us what to do. <laughs> oh, Jill's enjoying them. <laughs> I don't dare pick them up. I might get stuck in them again because they were exciting. Adventure. <laughs> but when we are trying to do it, God steps back and says, well, off you go. If you want to do it your way, I take my hands off. Why? Because he's given us his grace for everything that we need in life. Every area. Let's turn over, please, to Galatians 5. Without the grace of God, we have absolutely nothing. Yes, you might have a really strong willpower and you will get somewhere in some things. But with the grace of God, you'll get to the end of what you need to with his help. 5 verse 4. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law, for you have fallen from grace. What a horrible verse. Think about it. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen for gra from grace. What's it talking about? Just what I've been saying. Trying to do it in my own way or trying to get God to operate his promises by what I do. It's not about what I do. It's about what he's done and let him show you what to do. But because we've been so trained in do this, this will happen. We live a lifestyle in God of Okay, if I do this, somebody else did that. I heard a testimony. Somebody stood on the Bible and got a result. Well, I'm going to do that. So now I make it a rule and a law. What am I doing? I'm severed from Christ when I make it a law. When it becomes something, well, I have to do this. Yes, I need to say good things over my life, but if I make myself a law that if I don't speak positive confessions for two days, then I've failed. No, it's about what I think about myself and what I declare in everything I say. But if I get up every morning and say, oh, woe is me, poor me, I'm just a this and I'm just a that. No, I need to I know that I have the mind of Christ. Do you hear what I'm saying? We need to not put rules on it. Well, years ago we had this wonderful um, thing come out. It came out from um, a friend of ours had brought it back to Australia from the States and, and um, it was how to pray for an hour from the scriptures of the Lord's Prayer. And it had, you had five minutes to praise God, then you had five minutes to do this and then you had five minutes to do that. And if you didn't get through it all in that hour, then don't you miss the end of the day because you've got to get it done before the end of the day. What happens? You come into bondage and you lose the grace of God. Every time I make a law around something that is a, is a power of God, then I lose what God's doing. Why? Because he just likes having fun with his kids. He just wants us to talk. He just wants us to allow his presence around us all the time. I don't go off and have a set hour with God. I want to spend all day with him. I talked to him. I had a phone call this morning that was quite distressing. So what did I do? I talked to him about it. I have a daughter in London with a mouse problem <laughs> running all over her bed. She's in a hotel trying to get some sleep. <laughs> but it, it's horrible. She's in London. That's 24 hours away from here. <laughs> but he's there. I can talk to him about it to help her. But I didn't have to wait till I had my specific prayer time. No, I did it then. I get in the shower and talk to him about what's going on the day. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm saying? It's about, like um, Charlotte said, it's about our relationship. We do have a relationship. Let's not make it a law. 
Let's make it something. I mean, I don't have a set time where I'm allowed to talk to Rod. He's going to put up with me all the time. It's not. Well, between 8 o'clock in the morning and 9 o'clock, it's our set time to have a discussion and have a talk. Excuse me? <laughs> you see, that's what we do with God. What a weird relationship. If that's what I did with my husband. Well, come on, it's 8 o'clock. You can talk to me now. Quick, you better get it all out. Everything that you're thinking. Come on, it's about time. Let's get this done. And now, okay, bye, see ya. I'm off. I've got plenty to do. That's what we do. That's what we've allowed ourselves to be convinced of in God. Now, actually, I talk to Rod when he comes in the house all the time. Is that right? So let's stop trying to do things our own way. Let's start being a people that let the grace of God be our guide, our leader, our, our um, forefront for breakthrough. Amen? Falling from grace is doing things in my own strength. It's trying to get approval from God or, for people, or from people by my performance. We need to be very careful. God is not performance bound. I can make a good job or a bad job. God still loves me. I still have an open heaven. I'm still greatly blessed, highly favoured and deeply loved. The enemy can come at me after a meeting and say, well, you said this and that was wrong. And I can go into a nosedive of feeling miserable and guilty or say, well, thank you, Lord, you show me, because I, usually I know that it's the enemy that's done that. God doesn't accuse. He just loves on me all the time. But I've got to know that he's the one that loves me. Amen? So let's keep the grace flowing, then we won't get bitter and twisted and angry and cranky. And we'll start to see the power and grace of God flowing through. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Father, I just thank you right now for your word. Lord, I thank you that we have hearts to hear what the Spirit is saying. Lord, that your word goes deep into our hearts and brings revelation and breakthrough. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we bless you and we thank you. Amen.